I'm, my name is Pete Budnick, and I'm familiar to maybe halfies or more of you. Uh, uh, I'm married to Carolyn Austin, who is Ted and Lynn's daughter, who would be Lou and Virginia's granddaughter. Carolyn's, uh, uh, Carol and I both worked at Capon for a number of years. Well, she was born and raised here. When I tell her I work, I've been here 50 years, she says, well, I've been there 71. So we don't get very far in that discussion. Uh, we, uh, we, did, we were both school teachers early on, and then uh, we worked here in the summer times. And then when the second generation retired, uh, we uh, came to work. Carolyn took care of the food service, and I uh, was responsible for the golf course and the building maintenance. So, and I, I was, the, I was a middle, middle school history teacher earlier, so I had a national leaning toward history. And my first few years here in the wintertime, I had nothing to do. So I started to research the history a lot of, and, uh, and learned a lot about it as time went on. And a lot of people came into our lives over those next num number of years that helped with the history of Capon. So I talk kind of fast. I haven't done this in eight years. I'm not sure how connected my this is going to be to this, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> if at any time you want me to repeat something or you have a question to ask, uh, yeah, go ahead and do that. And, and uh, we're going to start here. And if you really want to, and then we'll walk around and look at the buildings and talk about where that, when that building was built, what might have happened to it over the last... Well, since Lou Austin took over in the nice last 90 years, but even prior to that. So, trying to remember how to start. I, I start by saying in the year 1886, that was the heyday, that was the golden age, that was the target for springs resorts in America. If you, were, if you had a springs hotel in 1886, you were doing right well. It was a very good time. Uh, indeed, this place in 1886 maybe had six to 700 people here at a time. So it, w it, was, it was a pretty good one in 1886. Forty years later, there was only about 250 Springs Resorts. Did I say in 1886 there were 643? They were down by 40 percent. It was down in the low, in the low two, uh, 250 in, in uh, 40 years later. So something happened in between those 40 years, from 86 to, to 1927. Uh, but to get there first, I'd like to say what happened to get them to the 86, and then to get to 27, and then we'll talk about, I'll talk about Capon. Uh, people came to these places to take in the waters. That was, that was what it was called, taking in the waters. Uh, you, you would come, and the main reason was to take the water. The second main reason was to get out of the city. If you lived in the city, in the season was June 1st to October 1st. And the main reason was to get out, the second main reason was to get out of the city. In the 70s and 80s and 90s, there was no public sanitation. Everything just went out the window. wasn't a very pleasant place to be in the, in the winter, in the summertime. So they, it was great to go here. And if you went to one of these places, it was a great social place to go because you met people like you and the people you wanted to be with. So you would go to the Springs Resort. And you also, of course, went for recreation, whatever the place had to offer. And this place had the same amenities as all the other Springs Resorts. So uh, people came for those reasons. As time went on, and I, let me process my thought. Boop, boop, back. Okay, the uh, uh, the history of all the Springs Resorts are similar. In in first, I said what they came for. The history is similar. First of all, the Native Americans came to the springs, whatever the spring was. And you've heard of you have, anytime you drive down the road, you see you go on a road trip, you see so and so springs, so and so springs. They're all over the place. Uh, first, the Native Americans came. Then they weren't they weren't important until someone discovered them. A white person discovered them, and then they then they were discovered. And usually took the name of the person who discovered the spring. Then they uh, that person might have gone back to wherever he came from, told his neighbors, told his friends about this water that he tasted. And it was just a, a pool of water at that time. It wasn't anything more than that. And, uh, and he might have attracted people to come and do like he did. To, he did. And it was always he's at that time to try uh, for a while anyway to see what he enjoyed about the water. And they'd come and they'd taste the water. And the next phase of development of these springs then was as word spread. People would come and they'd pitch a tent. They'd throw some kind of a shack up. If they really felt like it, they'd build a cabin, some kind of small cabin where they could stay the water. Well then it wasn't a long period of time until the owner started to say well if these people are going to come here and pitch a tent and they're going to lay on the ground and sleep just to drink the water maybe you ought to attract them with some place to live. So the places were then subdivided or if you want to call it today's words into towns or, or, or places where people could buy a lot and then they could build their own house or their own cabin or it was their own place to be to when they wanted to come to the springs. So that was the next phase of development. Well then the next thing you go well if they're going to sell a lot and people are going to build a house, someone's going to say, I'm going to take guests in my house. 
that would be the next reasonable step. So someone may be able to build a house a little big enough so people would come in and stay in their house with them. And it'd be like a bed and breakfast kind of a deal. And they could travel to the spring and drink the water. And that's about all they could do at the time. They weren't developed enough. Well, it didn't take them much for the next step for someone to say, well, I'm going to buy a couple of these lots and I'm going to build a hotel there. Now I'm going to take people in. I'm going to really be a, a, a hotel person. And well, then the hotels got bigger. And then the, the golden age came in the 70s, 80s, and 90s were the golden age of the Springs Resorts, where these places had hundreds and hundreds of people coming. If you went to a Springs Resort, you went there to try their water. The reputation of the water was such that, oh, you want to go to so-and-so spring because it's going to help this. You want to go to so-and-so spring because it's going to help this. So the people that had the money would spend the whole summer going from spring to spring to spring to spring. They'd cover all their bases. Capon was always a stop on that, what was called the Springs Tour as the time went on. As the, hey, as the golden age came, getting into the 1880s, 1890s, and near the turn of the century, into the 20th century, the Springs Resorts started to fade. They faded for a number of reasons. First, the medicine got a little better, and people stopped kind of thinking that drinking water or bathing in water was going to be their solution. So they started to have other reasons, and the water what didn't have, taking the waters didn't mean what it meant 25 years ago. Uh, the second thing that happened was uh, transportation improved. You could go some places. National parks were starting to be built. You could go out west. You could get in a train and go anywhere you wanted to. So it wasn't like in the south people went to the springs, and I read somewhere that if you went to a far away spring, that was a lot more impressive than your neighbors than to go to the one five miles away. So you wanted to travel farther away. The third thing that happened in the 90s was what was called the Panic of 1893, which led to a depression that was lasted for three years. So it was a terrible economic downturn. So people weren't as, as disposed to go to go uh, on a, to the springs. And, uh, and then the last thing that happened, typically when this downward trend started to happen, uh, something catastrophic happened to that spring. Whatever that might be, we'll get to that later. I think I've gotten to the point where I can start talking about Capon now. <laughs> and how it fits into that, that situation. And I do that remembering that I, I keep a thing with dates. So I'm gonna, if I've learned on a date, I'm changing subjects. 1765, in 1765, a gentleman named Henry Fry, he lived in Frederick County, Virginia. Uh, keep in mind, this was Hampshire County, Virginia. We were in Virginia till June 20th, 1863, when uh, in the middle of the Civil War. So a person from the neighboring county came through and heard about the water, uh, it, the Indian name for Capon or Capon or Cacapion or whatever you want to, any, derivate, any way you want to say it, meant medicine waters to the Indians. And so he heard about the water. He came up and tasted it. Henry Fry was a, a reasonably wealthy person, but pretty well, to, well known in Frederick County, Virginia. And he came and he tasted the water and said, well, yeah, it's pretty good stuff. And uh, decided he would go back home and he told people about it. And people then would come up here and pitch tents. And through the 60s and 70s, this is the 1760s and 1770s, this is what was happening. Not a lot going on around here. Uh, but in, in 1787, the man who owned the property, his name was Joseph Watson, uh, he passed away and he didn't have any heirs. So somehow or another, the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, got the land back and uh, then had ownership of the spring. So Berkeley Springs, not too far away from here, was doing pretty good at that time. So Virginia's going, well, if we can make money in Berkeley Springs, we can make money at Capon Springs. So the uh, General Assembly of Virginia in, in December of 1787 decided to lay out the town of Watson, named it after Joseph Watson, what, the town of Watson or Watson Town. It was laid out in 37 lots, easy to configure, 66666 six, 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 times 666, there was 36 lots, and then there was a thumb that stuck out up at the end, and that was the spring lot. The spring was never to be sold, it was always to be owned by the state, by the government. But they were going to sell these 36 lots, and they laid out streets, this was later called Bath Street, there was a, anyway, anyway, I don't want to talk too much about that. Uh, so Watson Town was laid out, and it, this was the next step in development at Cape and Springs. Lots were sold. People started to build houses there, but not a lot was going on in the, in the uh, 1790s, 1800s. But starting about 1810, 1815, 1820, things started to grow a little bit more here. And uh, the next date I spit out is eight, 1833. That's when uh, some of you have, uh, read Virginia history may have heard of the uh, Virginia, uh, Virginia historian Samuel Kirchville in the history of the Valley of Virginia in 1833 wrote about Watsontown that there are 17 or 18 houses 
in Watson Town in 1833 and a boarding establishment capable of accommodating 50 to 60 people. That boarding establishment was owned by a, a Revolutionary War veteran, uh, Major, quote, quote, <laughs> William Heron. Uh, Major, Major Heron uh, was uh, uh, fought with George Rogers Clark out west, fought the Indians mostly during the Revolutionary War in, in Kentucky, uh, Ohio, and Indiana. And he had some war injuries or war ailments. He, was, uh, he lived in Culpeper County, and he was one of these people that came up and tested the water. And he found not only did the water, was the water good for him, but on the edge, around the spring, and those of you who were local or have ever been to the pool when it hadn't been cleaned for a long time, there's this green stuff that grows around the Cape and water. And if it's let go long enough, it gets really thick. And Major Heron found that this was really good to rub on stuff. And it would make him feel a lot better. It was a, a, a some kind of, so he decided to, to move from Culpeper County and live here. He built what was called the Heron Hotel, which is the place that accommodated 40, 50 people. It's up near the Fairfax. It's either in the parking lot or the volleyball court. I never have been able to determine which one, uh, which exact location it was from, from the deeds. But Heron was here and, uh, and he was doing very well. Uh, Heron was actually, was not a major in the Revolutionary War. He was actually a sergeant. But I expect if you were running a hotel, it was a lot better if someone came in and said, hey, Major Heron, I need this or that, rather than, hey, Sarge, I need this. So uh, Major Heron did very well for himself. He died in 1847. His stepson took over his holdings. His stepson had a nice name, Julius Caesar Waddle. <laughs> JC was, uh, was a hotel man. He actually uh, was in the hotel business in the 50s in Winchester. If any of you are familiar with Winchester and know where the McCrory's Five and Dime used to be, it was, the, it was called the Taylor Hotel back in the 1850s. It was the place to stay in Winchester. J.C. was the manager of that in, in the 1850s and turned into the 1860s. He came up and took care of the Heron House and, and between there and here, and he, built a, he bought a house on a farm down along the river, down uh, the bridge, left turn, about a quarter of a mile, uh, called Haywood, his farm. And uh, he spent quite a bit of time here and bought a, several lots around here, and things were going reasonably well for him. The next date that comes out of my mouth is 1849. That's the biggest one, I, I think, anyway. In 1849, the Watson Town, now I forgot to mention, Watson Town, in order to administer the holdings of the state of Virginia, uh, Watson Town had a 10 member board of trustees, and they were supposed to, their sole purpose in life was to make money for Virginia. However they could do it, they were supposed to do it. Selling lots, selling water. There was a water tax. If you came here in the mountain in the, in the 1880s, you paid a tax to, if you stayed here for over five days. You paid a tax uh, that went to the state. That was how they got some water. And we'll get more about that. Uh, 1849, the Board of Trustees of Watson Town sold 12 lots to a firm out of Baltimore, Maryland, Rickard, Buck, and Blakemore. Those 12 lots were right up the road right where the meeting house is, up to the Poe and the Austin, and back up the hill. Uh, they sold those lots, and the condition of selling those lots to, to Rickard, Buck, and Blakemore, John Robert Rickards was the leader of the, of the group, and the Blakemore was, Thomas Blakemore was from Baltimore, and uh, William Buck, William Buck, John Buck, was from Front Roll. And uh, uh, the condition of selling it was they had to build a hotel comp, uh, that could accommodate 300 people, and it had to be completed, this is December of 1849, it had to be completed by July 1, 1851. July 1, 1851. Rickards put in $15,000, which was no small amount in that time. Buck and Blakemore each put in $7,500, which took to a grand total of $30,000. When all finished, the Mountain House, as it was called, cost $75,000. A little bit of an overrun. They, they, were, in, they were in debt. The Mountain House, and I should talk about it now, started right almost here where the Hartrue Tennis Court is, went up the road 264 feet where the Mountain House, where the Tennis Court is. It did an L back this way, 192 more feet. Not much at math, but that's almost 450 feet of frontage. It was four, four living stories high. The first floor had uh, everything you'd want if you came here to the middle of nowhere. It had, had a dining room that could seat up to six to 700 people. Uh, it had a, a ballroom for the band that played every uh, six nights a week. It had 168 guest rooms, roughly 56 on each floor, second, third, fourth floor. It was a big place. Some, le some things say that it was the largest hotel to watering place other than White Sulphur Springs in, at that time, whatever. But it was big. 
Uh, it, was, uh, it was built in 1849 and 1850 by Rickards, Buck, and Blakemore. I mentioned before that they went in, way into debt for it. At the exact same time that was happening, across the way, the pavilion was being built. That's the oldest building on the property now that looks like it looked when it was built. That's a nice English way of saying things. <laughs> that, that, was, that was built by the state of Virginia, Commonwealth of Virginia, I should keep on thinking. That was the, those were the baths. On the lower end, and we'll look at that when we go walking, but at the lower end there were 20 baths for the men, and the upper end there were 12 baths for the ladies. And uh, I'll talk more about that later. But the combination of the mountain house, which could accommodate 300 to 400 people, and the baths, which were said to be as fine a bath house as anywhere in the country, really made this place a destination starting in 1850. So the, pla uh, the place opened, and, and it ha remember I said before, July 1, 1851, the grand opening banquet was held on July, uh, June 28, 1851, two days early. They opened the mountain house. Uh, Rickard, Buck, and Blakemore pulled it off didn't pay for it, but they pulled it off. They had a speaker that day for the grand opening, who was a very well-known orator, Daniel Webster. So it was a big to-do. Daniel Webster at that time, 1852, he was the Secretary of State. He was running again for the Democratic nomination for president, uh, and this was a place where he would want to be. He gave a speech, and that's my first little thing I have to read, and I, I don't read well, but I will read this one, because if you don't enjoy it, I enjoy reading it anyway. The, uh, <laughs> There were two newspaper articles I read after the fact that were there. The hotel was opened with great eclat, whatever that means, with an assemblage of notables from every section of the country. Daniel Webster was the orator of the occasion, his effort being described by one of his hearers as the grandest speech by the grandest man that was ever born. Webster stood on a table in the great dining room, all along the, all along the French windows which were thrown open Upon the gallery, which hung a jar in order for so the, the windows hung a jar in order for the vast audience, is standing up the lawn, far up the mountain, to take in his, his words. I'll just kind of skip that a little bit. Anyway, the oration continued for two and a half hours, the voice of Webster penetrating the entire time to the utmost limits of the crowd and holding it entranced. Now, two and a half hours, come on. Uh, in the evening, there was a big barbecue and sheep and oxen were roasted upon the lawn. <clears throat> the other uh, one tells a little different story of, the, of, of Webster's speech. And this is by a local deputy sheriff who happened to be here for it. And he, he said, and this, this is a quote from a newspaper article some, some years later. He heard, meaning the deputy sheriff, Daniel Webster at Cape and Springs make a speech, uh, blah, 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 blah. Mr. High School, he was the deputy sheriff, appeared to think that Webster's Cape and Springs speech was colored by the hospitality he was enjoying there and the liquor of which he drank as copiously as of the water that flowed from that famous spring. No matter what, Daniel Webster spoke two and a half hours at the grand opening of the Mountain House and it opened and it did all right for the first couple, three years, uh, but at the end of 1852 and the beginning of 1853, not only were they still the $75,000 in debt, but they were $8,000 of operating expenses. So they weren't even paying their bills. So this is the middle of 1853. Well, Rickards had talked Buck and Blakemore into joining him, and they're, they're in a hook for a lot of money here. So Rickards did the only thing he knew what to do. He took his family and went to Australia. <laughs> he can't... He, Moved to Australia and didn't come back for six, six till 1859 and left Buck and Blakemore stuck here. Well, they weren't going to pay their debts, so the Board of Trustees of Watsontown set up uh, uh, the bankruptcy trustees, which took over the debt, and tried to sell the place, the mountain house. That wasn't going to be sold. The, the baths were always the property of the state, never going to be sold. But they wanted to sell the mountain house. They couldn't sell the mountain house. They leased it every year in the 50s, 55, 56, and so on, to a proprietor who would bring people in, and some of them did right well for that period of time. But if we remember our history well, something bad happened in 1860, 61, which kind of meant if you were going to be a Springs Resort in this part of the country, you weren't going to do a bunch of business. So the Civil War comes in, and the place effectively shuts down. And uh, uh, not much, not, not, nothing happened here. Uh, obviously, if you come over the mountain to come to Cape, and you know it's a great shortcut to go to there, so there was a good way for troops to go from there to there. So they did come through periodically. Uh, the only time that I, I, I remember uh, 
I ever read about was one time a, a brigade of 4,000 4, came and spent the night here, used the mountain house, and then moved up, over, up, went over the mountain and met the rest of its division on the other side of the, of, at uh, the other side where Route 55 is. So not much happened here in the 60s. Uh, after the war, I'm moving ahead pretty fast there. After the war, a gentleman came in named William H. Sale. William H. Sale was a Springs man, meaning he had, before the war, he had managed Rockbridge Alum, Alum Springs down near, up near Lexington in the Valley of Virginia. And uh, he came in and, and became a, le a leasee, whatever, of the property. And in 1875, he bought the place uh, for, I think, $30,000 or something like that. So he bought the mountain house. And then he set apart, uh, and uh, Sale lived until 1900. So in those 25 years, he got it. Not only was he good at what he did, but he hit it just the right time. So he revitalized the mountain house, brought it back, built most all of these buildings that are around us. This one was called the Annex, later called the Annex, the Annex to the mountain house because the mountain house didn't have enough rooms for all the business. There were originally 36 rooms in this property. If you stay in the main house, there are 12 on each floor. Uh, there were 12 on this floor also. So uh, this was built, and oddly enough, this one was built in 18... 86, no, it wouldn't have been 80, yeah, it would have been 80, 87 or 8. Uh, it was said, there were, this was a two-story building, and they took off the, the floor and built a third story to it, uh, which wasn't unusual around here, I, I understand from talking to people. But anyway, so this was called the Annex, and uh, there's a lot of, lot of things to talk about about the Annex, but, uh, you know, we, we got a lot of stuff to talk about here, and I don't want to hold you too long. The, uh, uh, so Sale did very, very well. He not only built a lot of other cottages around here, but he bought thousands of acres of property, and he did extremely well for himself. And uh, uh, in, in, in the 18, late 1890s, he brought his son-in-law into the business with him. His name was Charles Nelson. Uh, Nelson was not a hotel guy, but he was his only, do only child's husband, and that was a good fit in that regard. Uh, so uh, and Nelson came in, and when Sale died in 1900, in Nelson's defense, uh, it wasn't a good time to be in the springs business. These, as I told you, starting these things were starting to fall to decline. So Nelson came in, but he was able to accomplish one thing that his his father-in-law never did, and that was he bought the spring. In 1905, now the state of West Virginia, uh, in September 1905, uh, passed uh, some legislation that uh, sa basically said Cape and Springs isn't making any money anymore. We're losing money owning it. It's in disrepair. Let's do what we can to sell it. So I, I always tell this as the example. You know, there's that old, old uh, the, the, the bathhouse came along in the deal. The state got rid of that also. When the bathhouse was built in 1850, it cost $20,000. The spring is that old, uh, whatever it was, MasterCard commercial, say priceless. You know, the water was, was there. Charles Nelson bought the whole bathhouse in the spring for $5,000, uh, you know, 40 some years, 50 some years later. So you can get a sense just from that how much the, thing had, how much the springs had gone down in that time. Uh, Nelson was not successful what he did. He still kept the place going a little bit. He tried to sell it, and finally in 1917, he sold it to uh, a gentleman from New York City, Will Atkinson. Will Atkinson was uh, interested in selling Cape and Springs water, and he bought it to get the water rights. He bought it in 1917. He had grand plans to build what he called the Great Cape and Springs Club and bring the place back. Up on the hill where we have dinner on the hill, there's a uh, Sunset Lodge. Before that, there was a barn. And uh, uh, Will Atkinson was going to build the Cape and Springs Clubhouse up there. And the first, and 5,000, he was going to sell 5,000 memberships at $1,000 a membership. And if you act now and be the first 1,000 to, to buy, you will get a free half acre lot thrown in. So uh, none of that ever happened. He was going to build three 18 hole golf courses up there. It just wasn't going to happen, and the Cape and Springs Club never developed, and uh, the place continued to go downhill. He was broke. Uh, in 1932, as the, quote, highest and best bidder on the courthouse steps, actually on the courthouse steps, Lou Austin bought what is called the 320-acre property, which encompassed, this isn't that many acres, but encompassed all this, the spring, and, and some other things around here. And they bought that off for $16,500. Some say 15,000, some say 17,000, but let's just use 16 as a good round number. So he bought the place for that. So that's a snapshot of the Cape and history of, of this place. And I'll be happy to answer any questions because I, I, yes, sir. What happened to the mountain house? Thank you, that was the other date that I didn't say. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> what else did I mean? uh, 
in ni- I, 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 when I started talking a long, long time ago, the, uh, I said there's something catastrophic that happened. The catastrophic thing that happened to a lot of these places where there was a fire. And if business was good, well, you might build it back. If business wasn't good, cut your losses and leave. In 19, October 20th, 1911, a fire of suspicious origin burnt the mountain house down. Uh, it, was, it, it was closed. Remember I said the spring season was till October 1st, so there's hardly anyone here. Rumors from old timers who lived around here who told me this story 50, 40, 50 years ago said Charles Nelson was heading to Winchester on the night of the fire and someone told him that uh, the mountain house is burning, Mr. Nelson, and he said, yes, I know, and continued on his way. So whether that's true or not, it was, it was always thought that, that someone lit it up. So uh, it, was, it was actually, I think I read somewhere it was condemned at the time. It wasn't even fit for occupancy by that time. So thank you for bringing that date back to me. Yes, Don. Pete, being a former history teacher, are we going to have to take a quiz? <laughs> Pen or pencil, that's all I got to say. I mean, no, I, I, go, I go pretty fast, and, uh, but I, I hope I didn't go too fast that it didn't, didn't pick up there. I, I, if any of you would like to go along, we'll stop at the buildings and I can tell you a little bit more about, about each building. And, uh, and, and at that time, some other things that I forgot may resurface. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, and it's been, as I say, it's been eight years, so I went through all my notes and, uh, wow, I don't remember. Wow. Do you know if there's been any material change to the flow of the spring? Jonathan's the expert on that. But, but pro- more than likely, no. <laughs> In a short answer, no. They, it's pretty, pretty much been steady. Yes? When, when the, so after the mountain house burned, is that when Lou bought it? Uh, it wasn't for 21, 21 more years till he bought it. It burned in 1911. Nelson was still the owner at that time, Charles Nelson. Then he sold it to Atkinson. Lou Austin, I should, I should have mentioned, and I missed that again, another thing I missed. Lou Austin was distributed for Cape and Springs Water in Philadelphia. That's how he was tied up with Atkinson. And that's how he came down here to, to do that. Oh, I had something else to read. That, if that makes me think of it. Yeah, so that was 20-some years later when he finally bought it. So was, was this, were these buildings rebuilt by then, or he built it? Uh, the, the meeting house was, the, meeting house, we'll talk about them. But the meeting house was, actually, when I had pictures somewhere of the ruins of the mountain house. It stretches all the way up to the Po. Uh, the first thing that happened in that area, there were f- two tennis courts put there where the mountain house ruins were. One of them remains, the other one was up there. I have an interesting story. Not that you're stuck and I got a crowd, I'll tell the story. Uh, uh, of course, that William Sale bottled water. Uh, captain, I've never mentioned that William Sale was actually a captain. He was a Confederate cavalryman, captain. He was a, an act, a director of, of uh, of subsistence. He was, a, he was the guy who made sure they were fed in, in, the, in, uh, in Jeb Stewart's cavalry and then later Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry. So he was actually a Confederate captain, so he was well. But he had bottles. He had, we have their, Tom, is there still a sale bottle? That doesn't exist anymore, does it? It doesn't? Um, there was one. There. <laughs> there was one. When you go in the dining room, there's some Cape and Springs water bottles. <laughs> uh, Williams, a William sale bottle is a hard one to find. They were this big. Charles Nelson bottle, I think, is there. That's the warp one, right? When the mountain house burnt, there were a lot of bottles in the basement. Oh, I don't know how long ago this was. We were uh, doing something with the, te- with the badminton courts. They always got mucky, and you couldn't use them for days after it rained. So we were putting some drain tiles in, and then we were going to put some new uh, uh, limestone dust on top of it to finish it up, and now it's hard surface, but this was back then. We were up there with the backhoe. Someone came down to the hotel and got me, hey, Pete, you got to go up and see this. So I went up and see And they got into the storage room in the back of the mountain house basement. And they dug into all these shards of glass. And uh, as they dug, we found dozens of fully intact Charles Nelson bottles, which would have to be 110 years old now. Uh, dug up about 18 or 20 of them. And, uh, and, and that, they kept those. But there's probably a lot. Actually, the, uh, this is... People don't care that much about history, but when you go in the meeting house on the side steps going into the mountain house room, we, when we were digging there, in the footer for those steps, there's actually a bottle in the footer. So who knows when they did that, when the meeting house was built in 1957, 58, how many bottles they took out of that place and never even, never even cared about it. So did I answer a question? I don't remember. <laughs> Somewhere in there it'll come out.
So, if we want to walk, we'll go over to the swimming pool for, oh, I had something to read. <laughs> I'm glad I'm entertaining. Anyway, this is a, an article from the newspaper written by uh, John C. Cornwell. John C. Cornwell was the governor of West Virginia in uh, 1917 to 21. I guess that's four years. 1917 around here, Romley, and uh, he was, uh, he was a, a railroad guy and a banker. Uh, Lou Alston had met John Cornwell quite accidentally in the 20s, maybe even before that, when Cornwell went up to Philadelphia on business and Lou Alston was working as the secretary to the mayor of Philadelphia. And he was sent to the train station to bring Cornwell to meet the, with the mayor. Some years later, quite by accident, Lou Austin winds up in his county. And uh, this is what Mr. Cornwell, Governor Cornwell read. Most readers know, knew that Lou Austin is the proprietor of Cape and Springs. He is not a native of this county, but of Philadelphia, where he has, still has a home and an office. What many of them do not know, probably, is that when Austin took over Cape and Springs 20 or more years ago, so this was written in 50, 55, 53, 20 more years ago, it was about as desolate and neglected a spot as anyone could be found. The Mountain House, the big three-story hotel building which housed many distinguished guests prior to and after the Civil War had burned and the place had been completely neglected since. If you ever read an old McGuffey reader, there was a story about the sluggard. He was pictured as an old-fashioned picture uh, leaning on the front gate of his house of a tumble-down home with briars and brambles growing in profusion all over the yard and all around the house. That was a typical picture of Cape and Springs when Austin came into possession of it. So that's a nice little one I kind of dug up. From, uh, that was written. That was written in '53, but about what Governor Cornwell had seen when he came over. You this come way. out here on what's called uh, Back, Creek Road, Back Creek Road, and you come out down to the bottom of the hill at Jonathan's house, and you come up this way. That was one way to get here. The other way was to come out of Winchester about two or three miles, and then take what was called the Moorfield Winchester Turnpike, uh, and that came wandered through North Mountain. That's North Mountain. Is that's not North Mountain. North Mountain's the big one on the other side, where the power line goes over top. You wander through North Mountain, you come out on Route 55 at, at Duck Run. Everyone that comes to Capon on Route 55 knows you turn exactly two miles after Duck Run. Well, that's where the, that's where the, the, the train came and then it came, uh, I mean, the, the carriages came. In the 19-teens, in answer to your question, a train, the Winchester and Western Railroad had a, had a uh, that came about three miles from here. When you go down the road and you get just before, three quarters of a mile from the bridge, the road makes a, sweeping turn off to the right there's still the remnants of the Cape and, Cape and Springs uh, uh, of the Cape and Springs train station for the WW. Uh, in 1877 all of that well that wasn't around but the two other routes to Winchester were canceled out when the, when the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad built a train station in Strasburg where you come in Strasburg and you're on Route 55 <laughs> And 81 goes this way on the north east corner of that clover leaf. There was a, there was a train station. That was the Capon Road train station. That's 16 miles from here to the from the hotel to there. The Winchester route was 25, so it was nine miles shorter. If you're going by carriage, it's a pretty good deal. So that was the way most people came in during the glory days of the place over the mountain and in this way. The mountain road was built in 19, 1830 because Virginia wanted to get a better way for people to get into the springs. So they raised money by a lottery uh, to build that road over the, over the mountain. It probably isn't a lot better or worse than it was then, but, but it's, it's, it's still there. Uh, okay, the swimming pool was built in 1880. Uh, the, uh, it was built and run because it had water in it, was run by the Board of Trustees of Watsontown. It wasn't a private enterprise. If, because it was water related, it, had, it was built by them. If you wanted to go swimming in the water, you had to purchase a pool ticket. 25 cents for a, for, a, for a day ticket. The pool was exact same shape and configuration, size, elliptical, whatever you want to call it, as now as it was 142 years ago. Uh, it, and it was, uh, it had the little dish in the bottom so people could dive at the far end and things like that. The only big difference about it, other than, of course, it didn't have a concrete walkway around it, 
all around it there was a wooden colonnade thing that and maybe some of you had seen pictures of it somewhere. It goes at a column and then a whoop and a column and a whoop and a column all the way around the pool so you could get under cover. There were changing rooms over where the changing rooms were there at that time and uh, uh, that's a big, really the only big change that, was, that took place there. I have some quotes in this pocket that uh, about swimming in Cape and during the mountain house. I'll call it the mountain house days because that was 75 to 1900. Uh, first of all, the pool, it is constantly, and this, some, some of you will identify with this quote, some others will identify with the other quote. It is constantly supplied with fresh water of transparent clearness from the Cape and Spring at an average temperature of 66 degrees which by exposure to the sun, sound familiar, is brought up to 70 degrees, thus bringing it within the range of all whose constitutions do not permit them to bathe in very cold water. <laughs> you know, there's the sound in the summer, but the day, pool, or the day after pool cleaning day when it's now 65, is the, you can hear it on the golf course, woo, in the morning. But uh, that, that's one way of looking at the pool. This is from an 1890s brochure, it said, and I'll try to, emphasize what they said. And the pool! Just think of a large enclosed pool of clean, light, sparkling water continually flowing. 90 feet long and 48 feet wide, varying in depth from three and a half feet to eight and a half feet. The water is always so clear and clean that a pen lying on the bottom can be, and the deepest part can be distinctly seen. But the real pleasure in italics, the real fun in italics again, experienced by visitors to Capon in this pool cannot be adequately expressed. A plunge in it has all the stimulating, exhilarating effect of champagne without the evil after effects of that fascinating beverage. <laughs> so that's how it was described in 1890s. Uh, the pool is a flow through pool. It's exactly as it was then. It's legal. Uh, in 1950 something, the uh, state of West Virginia passed their bathing regulations and there was a grandfather clause. Well, it was there at that time for 70 years already, so it was grandfathered to clear. As, as those of you who are here, it's pool cleaning day. Every Tuesday and Friday in the summertime, in the afternoon, the pool is cleaned, is dumped, its sides are scrubbed, and, and uh, it's washed out and refills overnight. Uh, there's a reservoir today, the reservoir, if you've ever wondered, there's a concrete reservoir right behind the, right behind the uh, lower pavilion here. That's what fills the pool overnight. There was another reservoir, but I don't want to steal that part of my story. Uh, one thing I always like to mention at this time, so some of you go as far back as John Brill. John Brill was a night watchman at Capon for a long, long time, and one of the night watchman's jobs was to clean the swimming pool. Well, the Board of Trustees of Watson Town, one thing that they did very well is they kept very good financial records. And we have their financial records from 1849 to 1880-something or other. And in it, they list who cleaned the pool. And they paid him two bucks to clean the pool. And the person who cleaned the pool, John Brill's name was John Wesley Brill. The person who cleaned the pool was John Wesley Brill. That was John Brill's grandfather, who cleaned the pool some two generations prior to him. So uh, anyway, oh, might as well, while we're standing here, talk about the baths. Uh, as mentioned before, built in 1850 by the Commonwealth of Virginia, there were 20 men's baths on this side. If you count the windows and doors, you'll come up to 20. And if you look underneath the windows, you'll see that the, blick, the bricks are not symmetrical. They don't look, they look like they've been filled in and they have been because there was a door leading to each bath. Typically on this tour, I take you all in there and show you one of the baths. Uh, I can't do that. There's some construction going in there. It's hard enough to get in in good times, but now we couldn't get in there. But the baths, when you go in, you go in at the level of the porch. You'd have a little changing room where you could wear whatever you wanted to. It was your bath. And you'd walk down a little ladder into a bathtub that was about, it's all brick about three feet wide, not the brick, the water, about three feet wide and about six feet in depth that way, and it filled, uh, and it filled to about this height, it contained about 500 gallons of Cape and water for you to bathe in. You could take a hot or a cold bath, depending on what your temp was. Now remember, 65 degrees, what it feels like when the sun's shining in July, go into your basement, Fill up a tub with 500 gallons of 65 degree water and say, this is going to be fun. I'm going to really enjoy this. <laughs> so I always read the, <laughs> always read the uh, little thing in this pocket. Uh, in 1885, oh, 35 cents for a warm bath. That's a lot of money in 1885. I remember when I was a kid, I paid 35 cents to go to the movies. 
Now you pay what? I've been in movies since COVID. I haven't been there a long time. I don't know what it costs. But 35 cents. Well, imagine what 35 cents was worth in the 1870s and 80s. 35 cents for a hot bath, a warm bath. There was a steam boiler back here that took care of that. Uh, 20 cents for a cold bath, which would be natural temperature. Uh, in 1885, the Board of Trustees of Watsontown, in their journal, they met twice a year. They met in June and October and carried on their important business they had to do. They, uh, they met and they kept a record of how many baths they sold each year. So in 1885, they sold 1,157, that's almost 1,200, warm tickets and 75 cold. So, <laughs> and that, that's not atypical for the whole time. It, 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 was, it was a warm bath kind of thing. Your extra 15 cents wasn't going wasn't to bother you too much. Well, the board of us, while I'm here, I'll also talk. Uh, on the upper end of the pavilion, there was uh, the ladies' baths. There were 12 of those. Bigger. That would be the reason. Same size, same size tub, but bigger. Yes? So you're saying uh, where we, each window we see now was a separate bath? A separate bath. Yeah. Each, each one went back, and, and you had, it was about, they were about six so feet wide. Pretty narrow. Yes, right, yeah. very narrow. If, if you go up to the spa, we tried to copy it when we built the spa and put the baths up there. There are three baths up there. We tried to copy it by making brick walls and making them about the same configuration as this. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, the Board of Trustees of Watsontown, let's see, the pavilion was probably the, changed over to guest accommodations in the late 1930s when plumbing, well, electricity came in the 37 and 38, 1937 and 38, electricity finally came this way, and plumbing started to be to be used, uh, started to be in all the buildings in the, in the late 30s. Uh, the Board of Trustees, when they came, the center section of the, of the, present, of the pavilion was called, a, when it was built, the bathhouse cottage, but it was later, it was quickly renamed the President's Cottage. I always thought it was the President's Cottage because a bunch of presidents came here. Well, it, no, it wasn't, although partially true. The, uh, the President's Cottage was called the President's Cottage because the Watsontown Board of Trustees, when they met twice a year, the second floor of the building was set aside as the perk for the president of the board of trustees so he and his family could come and enjoy staying there whenever they wanted to and, and in the president's cottage the first floor of the bathhouse cottage they were places parlors for people to sit while they waited their baths and there were offices there was a man, men's bathhouse attendant there was a ladies bathhouse attendant they gave you your towel and your soap if you wanted to use soap and such for for your time for your for your bath uh, I always mention this time also about the, so because we're going to walk up to the farther end of that. The Board of Trustees, when they met, uh, it seemed like they didn't conduct a lot of business. A lot of things weren't that, that if you read their minutes, it's like, what, they spent time on this? But anyway, in, their, in 1879, in their journal, they wrote how much it cost them for their, one of their meetings. And in 1879, for the 10 Board of, uh, board of, Trustees, uh, board of Trustees of Watsontown, they, their, their bill was $23.75 for hotel bill for that weekend, $5 to take care of the horses, $23.50, and $5, $48 for their bar bill. So <laughs> we're trying to figure out how much work they were doing. It was, if, you were, if you got to be in the Board of Trustees, it was a pretty good gig for that time. Down where the, where the Virginia cottage is and the Webster, that's, I pointed when I've talked about horses, the Webster cottage is where all the horses and carriages were kept. There were three or so stable and barns down there. Uh, Sid, uh, William H. Sale's brother, Sidney, took care of all the horses. So they had their own carriages that they went over to the Cape and Road station to get people and bring them over. So that was Sidney's job down there. The Virginia cottage, which is a little smaller cottage, well, it's bigger, adjacent uh, across the road from it, that was called the saddle shop. That's where they kept the saddles. Uh, in, in, 18, in 1942, it was converted over to guest accommodations, uh, the, the Virginia Cottage. It had two rooms in the front. Later, they put three small rooms in the back. I don't know if any of you ever have stayed in the old Virginia Cottage, and you actually would have paid to stay in there. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> not, not only was it slowly sinking into the ground, <laughs> but it was... It was this narrow, and there was a bed here, and the bathroom was in the middle. Oh, it was a mess. So uh, the Virginia Cottage was, there were, there were the two big rooms in the front, and three very small, narrow rooms in the back, all big enough for you to walk through and have a single bed. It was torn down in 1989, and in the winter of 89 and 90, uh, our crew, in six months, tore it down and rebuilt it. And my favorite story about that whole project, when I did the buildings, I obviously was involved with that. 
of uh, one, sitting over there with one of our maintenance guys as the guests, the first guests of the year, were sitting on the porch waiting for them to finish putting the screen doors in. <laughs> so uh, we'll go up the road if you don't mind, unless you have questions about the pool or anything. The warm baths, did you find the temperature that they heated it to? I don't know what it was. I, I only know that I've read, all I know that it could be heated to what you wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. So I guess they had it at a certain temperature and he mixed it. Uh, I know up here they're saying you get 102. 102, yeah. I, I, would, I would assume that it could be as hot as you could tolerate it, and, and they would mix it in with cool to make it more for what you wanted. You could stay as long as you'd like. The, uh, 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 the, uh, there was no real limit on it. If you, if you look at the number I gave you, 100, 1,157 warm baths and 75, basically 1,200 baths a year. The spring season is 120 days. 32 baths, that's 10 baths a day <laughs> on average. Now they'd be busier at other times, but first thing, we'll, we'll look at the bandstand or the music pavilion as it was officially called. The music pavilion was built in uh, the 1880s. It was actually over there where the hammock is, uh, but this was a better place to relocate it. Uh, the, uh, I was doing one of these spiels, wow, I don't know how long ago, 20 some five years ago. And one of the people with me, no, Pete, you ought to rebuild that music pavilion. Well, the person who told me, Jim Van Meter, uh, I said, well, Jim, you've been on Capon's board, and he had been on Capon's board. I said, you know, we're not exactly rolling in that stuff. We can't just throw this stuff and build a music pavilion just because it would look nice out there. He says, well, I'll pay for it. So uh, he did. <laughs> and uh, so we built the music pavilion, and that's the plaque will tell you that. And mighty, I think it was 99, 2000, something like that. But the original... Uh, we had plenty of pictures of it, so the architects were able to size it to make it that way. The old one, uh, uh, from what I understand from engineers and stuff, it would, it would sway so much in the wind, and it, it was only a matter of time until uh, it fell down. Till it, till it, became in the, it was exactly like this, except there was a railing all the way around it. Obviously, we put it in and we left the steps open so a band could play up there and be seen. The bands that did play up there could be seen because there was a smaller octagon-shaped bandstand inside the bandstand. So it was about elevated about this high, so they sat up there so you could see them over the railing. The mountain house, that's a good segue. The mountain house had, uh, every year they publish a brochure. And the front page of the brochure was very clear, clear to tell you two things. What was the band this year? because evidently that made a difference. The band played six nights a week in the ballroom over there, and they played in the afternoons at 4.30 out here in the bandstand. And the second thing, they wanted to tell you who the doctor was that year, because that was also important. I'll get to that, and that's my segue. So the, uh, we built that like that so with the open space so it could, you could have con concerts up there, weddings. I don't know how many weddings have taken place up there and stuff, but uh, it's not going anywhere because it's got so much steel underneath all that stuff, it's not moving anywhere. So it'll be there a while. But I wanted to mention the bandstand of the music pavilion. The doctor, up about where the honeymoon cottage is, the honeymoon cottage was built in eight, uh, 1947 and was, uh, uh, was open for that season. But to this side of it, there was a place that no longer there, but if you went up and dug around, you could find some glass and nails called the infirmary or the hospital. There was a doctor here all four months. And he, his job was, in, order to, in addition to being a doctor, to tell you how the very best way it was for you to take in the waters. If you wanted to do that, when you, got, when you arrived for your time, whatever your time was, you would set up an appointment. You'd go up to the infirmary, and you would pay him $5 for a consultation. And when he was finished, he would tell you what the best, way to, what the best time of the day to drink the water, how much you should drink it, and, and how often you should drink. And he would also tell you about the baths, what temperature you should bathe in and how often you should bathe in it. And that, that would tell you how you were supposed to take in the waters. He also made office, he also had office hours for a buck. You could go up and visit him anytime and talk to him after your original initial con consultation. Or if he could make house calls to your room for uh, $2 in the daytime and $3 at night. <laughs> so the, the, that was the doctor's office, the infirmary, the hospital. Directly behind us where that stuff is sitting was Union Chapel. Uh, in 1855, the Board of Trustees uh, authorized the building of a chapel for the hotel guests, hotel employees, and local folks to come and worship. And that was built in, in 1855. 
It suffered its demise in the second catastrophic event that happened to Cape and Springs. The fire was the first one. The next one happened two years later. I'll, ta I'll make you tag along to hear that one. Uh, let's see. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a way to hear. Yeah. It's, it's like, a yeah, it's like, yeah, it's a real cliffhanger. Music pavilion. Yeah. Okay. The Hampshire cottage, the Poe and the Austin were either built or purchased by William Sale in the 1880s. The mountain house wasn't big enough. With the annex, it wasn't big enough. He needed extra space for his guests. People, a family rented those cottages for the whole season and therefore it took on your name. For instance, the Poe was the, the Edgerton, the Nesmit, the Nesbitt, and, uh, and the Lewis, and that was the Gunther Gibbs and Larrick cottage, the Austin cottage. But you could have the whole place to yourself for the season. It was your place. Uh, all three of those buildings have undergone a lot of changes. I don't know how many of you go back in the, in the Hampshire. Tom would remember this. Uh, the original Hampshire was square. This wing here, and the wing on the upper side plus the addition in the back was, was not there. They were all added in the last, since 1980 something or other. Uh, the two big ro rooms in the mountain house, rooms in the Austin, rooms in the West, Austin, rooms in New Hampshire, rooms up in the West Virginia, and some of them in the Fairfax were all 15 by 15. That was just a typical size. So the, on the upper side, when, when Lou Austin changed it into accommodations and put some plumbing in, Two big rooms on that, that side, on each floor, four total. Three smaller rooms on this side. Put bathrooms on the upper side, on the big rooms. And if you, if you go back long enough at Cape and in West Virginia or other places, in that 15 by 15, the bathroom was carved out of a corner. So your room wasn't 15 by 15. It was L-shaped with this tiny little bathroom with those wonderful metal showers in, in, inside and a sink and a, and a commode. And, uh, that was that side. This side had the back room had a bathroom, but these two rooms in the front, one, two, and six, and seven, all they had was a sink. In order to go to the bathroom, there was a men's room on the first floor out the back and a ladies' room on the second floor out the back. They rivaled the back rooms of the Virginia Cottage for, uh, for uh, you know, for whatever you want to call it, for lack of, uh, not a very nice place. <laughs> they also were the fire escape. So if you're on the second floor of the, fair, of the, of the, uh, Hampshire and you had to go out because of the fire escape, you went through the ladies room and you walked across a ramp to go back onto that hillside back there. Uh, all that stuff was done in the last 25 years. The first thing was done, these one and two got their own bathrooms. Uh, and then la later, four and five, the, the little square that was in the room was taken out so the rooms could get bigger and put a tower on that end so the rooms were bigger and had their own bathrooms. And then the whole thing in the back with the living rooms and stuff were added. So that's the Hampshire. Well, while we're here, we'll talk about the Fairfax. Uh, the Fairfax's original name was the Waddle House. That was Julius Caesar Waddle's private home. He built it in 1856 when he decided it was time to come here and over, oversee. After his stepfather, uh, William Heron, had died, uh, Waddle played his time between Winchester and here. But he decided that he had to watch over things and come and stay here. So he built his family's house there. It was only two stories when it was built. He raised uh, six children in, in the Waddle House. And after... Uh, uh, Charles Nelson bought the place. They added a, uh, no, sale. After sale bought the place, he added the third floor and put some wings in. So now it has 17 rooms. A lot of changes have taken place in there also, but that was originally the Waddle, the Waddle House. Uh, let's walk up towards the spring and then we'll be, then I think I'm almost about talked out. It's, it's got all kinds of names. It's, it's called the Upper Ping Pong House now. It was a teenage corner when, uh, from the 50s until some people destroyed it. <laughs> Gee whiz, what am I, who am I looking at here? <laughs> who got into those machines and it was, the machines were too distant from the hotel that we couldn't keep an eye on them, so the machines were moved down to the, to the playhouse area. But anyway, enough of that. The, uh, if you look at there, at the stones underneath there, at the, foot, the foundation, underneath there is a 35 by 35 foot square water tank. It's still there. It's filled with 48,000 gallons of Cape and water directly from the spring, which is just right up there. When the baths were built in 1850, you have to plan for what could happen. And what could happen is you need a lot of water in a hurry. So the reservoir was built in order to fill the baths very quickly. And uh, there's a pipe that goes down through here. It's a rather large pipe. The reservoir line that goes from here goes in the upper pavilion down there on the snowiest day in this winter. 
There's nothing but a streak of green grass down through because the water's coming down at 65 degrees all the time, and it's uh, whatever you want to call that. Keeps it nice, nice and warm as it goes down through. Uh, they, they, originally, the reservoir just had a picket fence around it, but the Board of Trustees found that something was happening. People could go swimming without paying for it. So uh, they didn't build the building right away, but they, they uh, had a $20 fine for anyone caught swimming in the reservoir. $20, pretty steep, steep amount of money. $5 if you threw junk in there. $20 if you, if you went swimming. Uh, in the, in the eight, 1930s uh, or 1920s, Will Atkinson had the building built around it, put a floor in there. It turned into the square dance hall for a while in the 20s and into the 30s. And, uh, but it still carries the water. It used to be used by the pool. In 1991, when we put the fire sprinkler system in the main house, we needed year-round water. Well, it never freezes. It comes out of this. You can go down to the swimming pool on the coldest day you'd ever want to see, and it's there's not going to be. It might be a little skim of ice on the top, but it never freezes because it's always coming in at 65 and always moving. So this was the perfect place to use for fire sprinkler. So we have a, a 48,000 gallon tank. That's why that concrete tank that I mentioned a while back behind the pavilion was put in. That was put in just for the pool. So uh, that's 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 what happened there. Uh, of course, the spring. Oh, the cliffhanger. Where was that? <laughs> On the other side of the spring, there's a stone wall. Uh, it separates a couple of springs. There are three springs up there. The main Capon Spring, which John, I'm not going to steal anything from Jonathan, but that's the big guy. It puts out the most water. There's another one right, right adjacent to it, and then there's another one about 10 feet away. The one about 10 feet away is called the Beauty Spring. It's pretty potent. It has a lot of water to it also. And the one right next to the spring, the main spring, is called the Old Man Spring. In old literature, they talked about the fountain of beauty and the beauty spring as something that was good for you. I don't know what the old man spring was all about, <laughs> but it was, it was there anyway. The combination of the three all fill the reservoir. They do not fill your drinking water. Your drinking water is not polluted with old man spring and beauty spring water. Strictly Cape and spring water that goes into the, into, the, into the public water system throughout the property. Okay, on the other side where that stone wall is was a thing called the spring pavilion. It was built in the 1840s. It was a wooden structure, had about six or seven steps up to it. It was, pretty, it was probably as big as the, as the main part of the teenage corner. You go up there and sit, and if you wanted to drink a, a glass of Cape and water, you would walk down the steps to the spring. The spring was not enclosed at, at that time. The spring house built in 1920. It was open. The inside of the spring house looked much like it looked in 1880. It just wasn't enclosed. It would mean, whatever you see when you go in the spring tour, it looked pretty much like that. You walk down the steps and there was a guy there called the Dipper. The Dipper had one of these things, that uh, little metal thing, the wiry thing that you could hold six glasses or four glasses of water and you say, fill me up with four please. And he'd dip it in the spring and he'd get, give you the glasses and you'd go up into the spring pavilion and, and drink your water directly from the spring. Uh, old Joe Alexander was the was this Dipper for about 50 years and the Board of Trustees allowed him to put a sign up there that basically said, I work for tips. And uh, so he spent his days there feeding with water. The spring, the, the, what happened on, on April 13th, no, April something or other, 1913, I have to go, I've got to step back here. On the other side of the spring pavilion, uh, there's, where the creek comes through, there's a gap. And, and it looks like an earthen dam on both sides of the gap. And that's because it was. William Sale owned two acres of land down by the river which he used for fishing and boating at Cape and Lake. But it was four miles away. So he said, I'm gonna put a, a lake up here. So he built a lake just on the other side of the spring pavilion with an earthen dam. If you go on the right side of the mountain road, just around the bend there, you'll see two or three places where it's gouged out. That's where they got the ground, the dirt, to build the earthen dam. Well, in April of 1913, a very rainy time came and the dam burst. It wiped out the spring pavilion, came down through and wiped out the Union Chapel. And that was the other cat catastrophe. And also took out a lot of boardwalks. There weren't sidewalks here in Mountain House days, there were boardwalks that you'd walk across all over the place through here uh, uh, for that sort of thing. I'm, I'm trying to think. The West Virginia, I know some folks here stay in West Virginia, you know what it was. Uh, William Sale had the West Virginia built in the 18, late 1880s it was a bowling alley. All Springs resorts had a bowling alley. It was like 
Honey, we're going to go up there to Cape of Springs, West Virginia. It's 150 miles away, but we're going to roll some bowls, bowling balls. Why would you come all the way up here to roll balls? They'll go bowling. But they all had a bowling alley. The first bowling alley was up on the hill above the Brent Cottage, and it was too much walking to go up there, so Sale thought he should put it down here in the lower level. Uh, two, two lanes going up through, uh, uh, two on the floor. Uh, the West Virginia was, after the bowling alley days, was converted in the 1940s to guest accommodations. The same configuration as I mentioned before, 15 by 15, carved out a bathroom in the square. Back in 90-something or other, we put the bathroom in the back, made the rooms big again, took the bathrooms out, I moved the bathrooms to the back, and put the cover on the porch. And uh, that was that was a big to deal, big 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 project, and uh, a big improvement because the rooms were they not only were were with his carve out, but they had pretty well served their time by that time. Put it that way. Here, where this black car is located, just like to the back of it, was the photography studio. T. G. Smith from Martinsburg, West Virginia, spent the spring season here taking photographs of anybody who wanted to take him, whether you were a guest. If you wanted to go up to White Cliff and get your picture taken up there, he'd go up there with you and take your picture. If you wanted to go even up to Eagle Rock by horseback or something, he'd go up there or anything. The reason it was there, there's a, wet, there's a spring in the middle of that. It's not there now. I mean, it's there, but it doesn't, it's not surfaced now. But there was a spring there, and he could use that for developing his pictures. And so it was in the middle there. The log cabin, I think I'm running out of that, running out of steam. The log cabin was built in 1830. Uh, Historically, it was said to be Henry Fry, the 1765 guy's cabin, but it wasn't. It was built in 1830 by a, a man from Winchester, Virginia, named Philip Williams. Uh, he built it as a place to come and take in the water. This is before the mountain house, 10, 10, 15, 10 12 years before the mountain house. He stayed there. The reason the log cabin, there were a number of log cabins around here. The reason that one lasted is because when the mountain house was finished in 1851, uh, one of the stonemasons name was John Ward. Rickards invited Rickards of Rickards Buck and Blake were invited him to stay on and become the night watchman and John Ward was the night watchman for 50 years and that was his house uh, he had an addition on this end and he raised he and his wife Bridget raised seven children in the log cabin with the addition which was not quite as big as the original it does have a loft but it's still not that big and uh, they lived there for 50 some years until he passed away and his family just gave up gave up claim to the house any questions? I think I'm. Before this log cabin was refurbished and rebuilt, and I remember when it had the old carriage mm -hmm. in it, before the carriage was restored. Yes. And it was all falling down. But wasn't there a sign there that labeled it as Fry Cabin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, the white, the white sign set on the, yeah. to this side. Yeah, but it, 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 tracing it back, we couldn't, we couldn't take it back that far. But we do know that Williams bought that lot. And we knew he built a log cabin there at that time, and he was the type of person who would build it. He was a Commonwealth attorney for Shenandoah County over this way. And uh, so we know that it was, he was, we know that that was his property. And also when Ward died in 1900, I think 1901, uh, his family gave up claim. And part of the agreement uh, was that, that he had gotten the cabin from Philip Williams for a dollar, but he had to give it up upon his death or something like that. So that, that Connecting all those kind of led it to Williams rather than Henry Fry. Now, is there ten percent chance? Yeah, it's ten percent chance. Could be Fry's. Yes, Bob. Brochures today say five thousand acres in the Great White Mountains. Uh huh. Was that what Lou purchased at that time, or did he build on the original? Purchase? He built on the original purchase. He bought. Uh, th there was a thirty three hundred twenty acre property. I mentioned that before, which is the hotel itself and, and adjacent. Then there was a ninety nine acre one he bought. And then from that point forward, he went and buy, bought property. All it's 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 like it's all over the place. Uh, but the biggest purchase was the mountain. Well, if you come over the mountain road and you get to the top of the mountain, you're at the Virginia West Virginia state line. From the, there, it's three, almost three miles to down to this spot. From there down, there are only two landowners, Cape and Springs and the National Forest. He, that's called the, uh, he bought that in, I can't remember, it's in the, by the decades, tomorrow it'll be read at the, at the thing, at the thing in the bandstand. He bought that 2,100 acres, it's called the Sheets Track, for like $2 an acre or something like that. And most of the land, most of the land he acquired was bought, everybody around here owned land. That's one thing everybody had. And it was only a matter of time until, well, I think I'm going to get rid of some of Grandpa's this and Grandma's that and stuff like that. And he, he bought the land in order to is isolate himself, insulate the place. So it was bought. It's 40, Jonathan, 4,700 yes. now. 
And he, What's the reservoir water under here used for now? It's just, it's... Uh, Does it recycle in and out at all, or it just sits there? It, it comes from here, and it goes down to the new reservoir. Oh, okay. Uh, but, uh, I'm going to be sure I'm like this, because I've been away from this a while. Yeah, it, has to, it joins the reservoir line and goes down. Okay. So this fills the new reservoir. Okay. I, it never uh, went on the day after the day after pool clean days. This thing may get down because it, that tank is not big enough to fill the pool. The pool holds about 110,000 gallons of water. That's got 48,000, but it's constantly getting over 100 gallons a minute coming in. So, you know, doing the, adding up the math, it never is enough to fill the pool overnight. So some of this will drain, but by 11 o'clock in the morning, this thing's up full again. And it'll be that way until the next pool cleaning day. Mm -hmm. Any ghost stories? <laughs> all I know is that the Fairfax was haunted. I know. That's, That's all I know. Okay. That was a that was something that was told to me when I was very uh, when I first was married. Uh, the the first the first weekend that I stayed here when I was married, uh, it was in May of '72. Uh, I was working in Winchester, and uh, I I didn't. I don't know what was going on. I had been here for a couple of years while Carol and I were pre-married. Pre and uh, uh, I, Andy Austin, who was, the, who was always telling, Andy and Steve were the two who you never wanted to get mixed up with because they were always going to tell you something that wasn't going to be good. And uh, uh, Andy told me that was haunted. So I, I, and he says, oh, you're staying up in the Fairfax. That's haunted. Just like he would tell you. And I said, oh. So I was working at Winchester at this place, and, and I came back at like 1 o'clock in the morning when I worked till midnight. And I came back my first night actually staying on the property, married. And at that time, there were steps leading up in the center, and right where that wonderful. downspout is there in the middle. There were steps that led. That's how you entered the building in the seven, before the 70s. You entered the building that way. Well, to get to, at that time, all the hot water everywhere was fired by coal. There was a coal boiler. So the night man had to, and every building had its own little, little that the, the Austin family was, very good at buying surplus. And uh, they bought these boilers, Navy, Navy surplus after World War II, and there must have been a hundred of them laying around. So if one of them, the water jacket ever burst on it, oh, you know, can't fix it, slap another one in. It was gone, ready to go within a, a half an hour or so. Anyway, I, I knew all these boilers were all around. Well, there's this light underneath the steps as I come walking across the parking lot. And they're, oh, okay. And I get there and the light flickers off and on and off and on. And all I can think of is Andy. And I get, I get really close to the steps. We were staying in room five here on the first floor. And out of nowhere, at one o'clock in the morning, hey, Pete, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and it was the night watchman at that time. And, and uh, that's as close as I got to, the, to the, That was good enough. That was Moss, Moss Rudolph. The other interesting character who was, she was supposedly a witch, was Betty White. Betty White was a waddle. She was Julius Caesar Waddle's oldest child. Uh -huh. And Betty White was, uh, uh, she had a bad life. And uh, she, uh, a week before she was to be married, her husband died. Her husband-to-be died. And then she remarried a couple of years later to a real bad guy who was abusive. And she had two children with him, and they both died very young. So she really had a rough life. So in her later years, she decided she was going to get away from it all. So if you ever hike up, there's a road, the road right behind here, right behind the spring house, up to there, up to the top of the hill, is what's called the, where the water used to come from for the water system before we converted over to what we do now, because it always gravity fed. It's like you had 40 some pounds of pressure from up there coming down at the mountain spring and the Betty White spring. Betty White built a house and lived the last 10 years of her life up there. And no one ever saw her. So uh, she was she was the other one, but she wasn't. There wasn't anything wrong with her. She just it's was. Like a little small pond reservoir. Thing yes. You go up that yeah, there, there are a couple, three of them. There's an old old metal or old yeah. wooden tank up there. Yeah. Oh, was that the one, Tom? Yeah. That's the one. Okay, we, it was clogged up one time, and we had to go deep sea diving oh. in that tank. <laughs> that was. Everybody read about that. Thing. Oh yeah, sorry. You put that in your journal this year. Yeah, 13 feet down, and that first five feet was pretty rough. But. <laughs> Any questions? I appreciate you sticking around with me. Bob? Is, is any of what you told us digitized yet? <laughs> I think Megan's doing something now. <laughs> I think someone taped something a while back, but I don't, I'm not, I think that was so long that the technology has improved dramatically since then. Well, yeah, but, yeah. but I mean, are the, are the public records in West Virginia digitally converted yet? I, 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 would, I don't know. 
this all came from my sources came from deeds at the courthouse from old brochures and things that people and a lot of people walked into our lives john robert rickards who built the mountain house his great grand nephew or something came in wrote a letter one day to the chamber of commerce of cape and springs west virginia looking for his great great uncle's summer home called the mountain house and uh, he came up from houston texas two or three visits and uh, had provided a lot of information. Julius Caesar Waddle's double great-grandson from Washington State. All kinds of stuff when he did his family history. And uh, 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 it just, a lot of it came in that, in that way. Or someone who, the Nelson fan, the people that knew the Nelsons, they kept brought stuff in. But uh, it's, it's easy research <laughs> that way. Yep. And if no other questions, thank you so much for coming along. I appreciate thank it. You. Oh, thank you. Thank you.